Hi, I'm Dr. Angela Yankee. And I'm Dr. Kathleen O'Neill Smith. Welcome back to the Fire Em Up Doctors, Good Medicine Doctor Series. We are so glad you joined us. We want to provide you with credible health resources, guide you in your treatment options, and fire you up to take control of your health. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Fire em Up Doctors webinar. We are so happy to see you all after pretty much a whole month off. We have missed you all very much, and we are very happy to be back today. Um, we did switch it up a little. I know last time we told you we would be starting out the new year with body composition, but we had a lot of COVID questions about, you know, the new wave and vaccines and stuff, so we decided to do a Q&A instead but we will go ahead and get to body composition as well as insulin and stuff next week. So I will go ahead and welcome your Fire em Up doctors, Dr. Angeli Mon Aiki and Dr. Kathleen O'Neill-Smith. Hi, everybody. Hi, Emily. Hi, Hi, Dr. Kathleen. Hey, everyone. Happy New Year. I'm so happy it's a new year and there's a glimmer of hope with this vaccine. And we've been doing a really great job managing our COVID infected and COVID exposed patients. Uh, we'll show you some of those statistics. And uh, I just wanna stop before I forget to thank Emily, who's been our moderator now for at least 10 months. She's gonna move on to another job and we have a new team coming on. So thank you, Emily, bravo. Emily, you're the best. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna miss you. I'll miss you guys as well. And also, thank you all for your concern. I had a family emergency and um, it involved my son in a, in a car accident. And praise be to God, he's going to be okay. It's going to take a little bit for him to rehab and get better. Um, but thank you all for your care and concern. Okay. Yeah, so today we felt like there were so many questions in both of our practices as well as our Fire em Up um, followers about the COVID vaccine particularly, but also some changes with the COVID, so we're going to do that today. We are going to do one session next week so on, on body composition and uh, carbohydrates and insulin resistance and back to COVID because there's a lot with COVID. Does that sound good? Next slide. Okay, so we're just gonna hit the ground running. First of all, this is a very sophisticated uh, question set on uh, the vaccines as well as some COVID questions that I know you all are reading and studying and staying ahead of everything. And we're just really proud of you all. A lot of these questions we don't know the answer to. I don't think science knows the answer to yet, but we'll, we'll go through the thought processes of what we're thinking and we'll be as honest as possible. Well, also, um... Angela, it'd be really helpful for you to talk a little bit about the group that we're in that studies the vaccine and talks a lot about COVID. I think everybody comes from their own position, from their own view, viewpoint of health and vaccines. Some people are in the vaccine world, some people are clinicians, some people are in the public health world, some people are in the treatment world, and some people are in the hospital-based world. So it's a really interesting group. Yeah, so Dr. Kathleen and I wanted to offer you the best that we could with those tough questions you were answering, you were asking. And so uh, we assembled a kick COVID-19 to the curb study group, and it consists of uh, three MD PhDs or double doctors. So they're clinicians and scientists, three PhD scientists, uh, one who is in who was in the public health service and the human genome project who knows science really well, another who is a president of a biotech company, and another, and another who is in the regenerative medicine uh, founder of a biotech company. So really hardcore PhDs, scientists, and then Dr. Kathleen and myself. And we sp have spent many hours and over 25 papers looking at um, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. And, and in fact, we're going to get together again in a couple of weeks to look at the fallout of the first round of vaccines, as well as the, um, the, the, the DNA-based vaccines coming on deck, which will be the subject of another talk, uh, the J&J &J or Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca vaccine. So at this point, we're coming from a fund of knowledge of active study with our, our study group that we're so blessed to have assembled. Um, and it was really reassuring to me, Dr. Kathleen, that a lot of our 
questions as a group, we all had similar questions and that when we dug into the literature of science, the, there's a lot of unknowns here, right? There's a lot of unknowns and, and it's really helpful to be in this group and I really appreciate the perspectives. I've learned a lot and I've really, I feel like I've done a lot of listening to, you know, all of everyone in the group about learning from them about what they understand and what they know and what their knowledge base is. So I think there's a lot still that has to be discussed, obviously, with multiple groups and multiple papers that have been reviewed by all of us. Um, the fact that we're continuing to meet demonstrates the challenges that um, are happening. So I'll start with this one. What is known about the COVID vaccines for people with multiple autoimmune diseases or autoimmune disease in general? Um, and that is a, a wonderful question. Uh, I, in fact, I had asked uh, the who I, uh, Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld, who uh, was kind enough to write the forward to our book, Kick COVID-19 to the Curb. I asked him to come and he's super busy, but he sent us 16 papers that he's published since February on COVID and autoimmune disease. And um, what I would probably take home from that is that um, number one, the COVID 19 virus itself can cause promiscuity and cause autoimmune disease. I mean, there's case reports all through the literature. In fact, Dr. Schoenfeld had published in Animal Models in 2014 how, uh, how COVID-19 induced um, autoimmune retinitis or inflammation of the eyes in animal models or in rats, number one. So, no, so when you look at, I consider receiving a vaccine, full COVID or fake COVID, F-A-U-X, COVID, meaning your body thinks it's COVID, it's making antibodies, so you could have similar reactions. And so it's not beyond my belief that there might be fallout of autoimmune disease from uh, these vaccines. Um, so do you have any comments on that? Do you agree, disagree? Well, I do, because I think that um, I agree. And I think that all vaccines can have fallout, all vaccines, but, and we're always weighing the, the risk-benefit ratio of getting a vaccine to getting a, you know, a, a disease or an infection or whatever it is. And so that has to be, and we've talked about this before, I think particularly for COVID, a personal decision. I think COVID is really, the COVID vaccine and the decision to get it or not is a very personal decision because there is, we've rushed into this. This hasn't been something that we've had lots of time to be considering, both in the science world, the PhD world, the MD world, and in the, the direct, the consumer world. So I think that it's a really important thing to just step back and explore why you think you need to get it, have a conversation with someone you trust, who hopefully is a clinician that's knowledgeable and then make the choice. Uh, case in point, just, just within the past three hours, I had uh, consultations with uh, people with autoimmune disease. One was an 84-year-old woman who has rheumatoid arthritis, who's on prednisone and immunosuppressive medication to control her bad disease. She's at high risk. You know, I consulted with the rheumatologist uh, to go ahead and proceed with the vaccine because she's very complex and multiple other medical problems. And about an hour later, I consulted with a 30-year-old woman who has rheumatoid arthritis, who's also on immunosuppressive medications. And um, they're very different conversations because they have, and they have to be individualized because these um, people, both women, have different sets of life circumstances, work circumstances, other medications, other medical um, uh, things to consider. So the end result was, was individualized. And I think it, these conversations have to be individualized. Well done. Next slide. How long should I wait to go to go for the second round of the COVID vaccine after I've gotten the first dose? Well, that's pretty clear. In the phase um, three clinical trials for Pfizer had 40,000 people in phase three that ended around Thanksgiving. Moderna had 30,000 um, and they basically make, came up with a protocol. So with the Pfizer vaccine, it's 100 micrograms at time zero, and then 21 days later. And then for the Moderna vaccine, it's 100 micrograms at time zero and 28 days later. So it's a prescribed regimen. What I don't wanna see is that we give away our first vaccine and then you're not unable to get a second vaccine because that's really bad science. 
Um, and there, I heard some chatter about releasing first vaccines and maybe not ha being able to get the second dose. I haven't heard that that's happened at this point. Have you, Dr. Kathleen, did you hear that? Well, I think there's some concern because there are doses of vaccine that are going to waste. And, and I think one of the, the uh, people listening had mentioned that they had gotten the vaccine because did, it didn't want to be wasted. But I think the reality is, is that in order to build immunity, this has been studied on how to give the vaccine. And the fact that we're considering doing it a whole different way is deeply concerning because we, it has not been studied in a whole different way. And in terms of whether or not it's protective, most importantly, right? Because the point of getting the vaccine is to, is to be protected. But if we change the way that we've studied it and we think and believe that it's protective in a certain way, time zero and then 21 days later at whatever dose, 30 or 100 uh, units, I think that it's really, really important. So this, this question, I think for me is really a good question. And it also demonstrates how much we're moving quickly, fast in this world at, which is why exactly I think we need to slow down, take a step back and think about individually who should get this vaccine and why. Yeah, that's well said. And I think, um, you know, just as an aside, we've been messaging through Kick COVID-19 to the curb and all these webinars since March, that really it's important to fortify your immune system, strengthen your immune system. Um, and, and quite honestly, I've had really great surprises, like people I thought would crash and need hospitalization. Like I had a 63 year old man who got COVID around Christmas, who has hypertension, diabetes, morbid obesity, um, used to be a smoker and has had many strokes. And I was thinking he was the exact person who would crash with cytokine storm and be admitted to the hospital, et cetera. He essentially sailed through such that on day 18, he was begging to go back to work, but he had had a low-grade fever four day, days prior. So I went ahead and re-swabbed him and I've kept him out of work, but he is itching to go back to work. He did fantastic. And it's happening over and over again. And so I'm collecting data for a case series to publish that really fortifying your immune system and being very aggressive with uh, what's called post-exposure prophylaxis, meaning you, get it, you, you got exposed because you were in a car with someone with COVID who got diagnosed the next day. Well, what are we going to do about it? And then being active about treating and not just saying, oh, you're COVID positive. If you get sick enough, go to the emergency room, which uh, Dr. Kathleen and I are very, very aggressive. And if you're in our practices, you know that we really keep you close to the hip should you have, should you have uh, COVID or what I th we think might be COVID. Well, I think just to clarify that there is prevention, which we promote, which is our book. There is prophylaxis, which is post-exposure. If you're exposed, the minute you know you're exposed, up the ante. And then there's treatment before you have to go to an emergency room. So within 24 hours of becoming sick with COVID, having a positive test and symptoms, that's infection, then we, we are proponents of treating you. And I think that that's not the standard of care. Both Dr. Aiki and I think that that should be the standard of care. So it's really important that if you think you've been exposed and you test positive and you are infected because you have symptoms, you know you're infected when you have symptoms, then you have to be in touch with the doctor to be, have treatment to prevent you from going to the emergency room. That's the goal. And Dr. Riki has done an amazing job with um, her patients, I think, keeping them out of the emergency room. One thing I want to mention, because it was a question, is that you, yes, you should always get the same COVID vaccine. Do not go to a different vaccine if you've gotten the first dose. The second dose should be from the same company. Yes, different companies. And, and, keep, and remember that different protocols um, and also different dosing, as I said, the Moderna vaccine is 100 micrograms. The Pfizer vaccine is only 30 micrograms. The efficacy at the end ends up being the same. But if you switch, there was no study <laughs> that switched them like that. So you don't know that it will be effective. Next, next question. What are your thoughts on the virus becoming latent and presenting reoccurring symptoms later on, such as seen with Epstein-Barr and chicken pox? Chicken pox's virus is varicella zoster virus. I read somewhere that this might be a, concerning, a concern, especially for people with chronic diseases or suppressed immune systems. 
I feel like this is something that I, that I work on in my practice every day. I feel like, um, so EBV and chickenpox, these are all herpes viruses. So they're in the herpes family of viruses, just with different names. And I think that we know that herpes virus one can be latent and can present with reoccurring symptoms at any point in time, whether it's a, on a, a lip cold sore or whatever. We know that herpes virus two, which is the genital herpes can, can be latent and can present with reoccurring symptoms. We know that their cella can present um, and we know that people can end up with chickenpox. So an Epstein-Barr has been written about extensively in um, the literature that we've reviewed, both Dr. Aki and I in our, in our class where we teach doctors, that it, is, it can recur and it can be, uh, it, is very, it is the number one virus or environmental factor, that's a quote, it is the number one environmental factor that is associated with many autoimmune diseases. So the reality is, is that they can recur. And so that's why it's key to do what Dr. Aki and I propose, prevention, boost your immunity, understand your numbers, understand your biomarkers. And, and each year, you're not going to the doctor to not be diagnosed with diabetes or or high blood pressure, you're going to the doctor to understand how well you are, not how sick you are, not are you gonna get one of those diseases that somebody has in your family. When you see a doctor like Dr. Aki and myself, a fire him up doctor, you basically are looking to know how well am I? Is my B12 adequate? Is my vitamin D adequate? Do I need vitamin C? Is my blood sugar optimized? Are my hormones optimized? We need to start with the nutrient level and we need to build to the hormonal level of which there are more than your estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid, et cetera. So it is really important to be visiting your doctor annually to understand how well you are and where you need to support um, necessary nutrients. So it is possible if someone ends up with a suppressed immune system because they haven't restored their suppressed nutrient status or imbalanced nutrient status, that they can get re reoccurring symptoms with COVID, with EBV, with shingles, with herpes one, or any of these viruses. So yeah, it realized that the, especially the Epstein-Barr and varicella zoster chickenpox, they're latent as is, um, or, or quiet. You rely, you're relying on your immune system army to keep them quiet in the dark closet. And then if your body gets attacked by stress or sunlight or, or COVID, um, your immune system is busy fighting whatever the acute thing is. And therefore these other things can resurface. And so exactly what Dr. Kathleen said is a fire them up model is to make sure that your castle, so to speak, is fortified and strong so that doesn't happen. It's always the immune system and the redox system, you know, the free radicals and the oxidative stressor that are going to be the internal environment, internal milieu that's going to allow these latent microbes to present with recur reoccurring symptoms. And that's what we look at. Great question. And, and by the way, I think that probably the Bell's palsy side effects that they had reported with the Pfizer vaccine that, you know, some people think Bell's palsy is viral related, maybe a herpes virus that got re reactivated. So I suspect that some, and I'm just guessing, but I, I, I'm, I'm suspecting that the peop, some people uh, got the vaccine and their immune system, which was keeping their herpes virus quiet, was able to be reactivated because the vaccine was um, caused the immune system to work to make antibodies. Mm -hmm. Next slide. For sure. My sister received the Pfizer vaccine on December 26th, but tested positive for COVID on January 11th. Okay, so let's stop there. They said after the first, the one week after the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine, there's 52% protection. So it did not protect her or she got infected prior to that. Okay, so let's move on. She is due for a second vaccine during her quarantine. Does she need to get the second vaccine? We talked about this actually in our Monday night group and with, with respect to the first part of the question. So there's the question would be, did your sister, whoever posted this question, did she get infected? So did she begin 
to have symptoms. So if she tested positive for COVID in her nares with the nasal swab and she didn't have symptoms, she was not infected, okay? If she tested positive and had symptoms, fever, loss of smell, taste, muscle aches, headache, um, respiratory issues, then she was infected. So that first part has an additional question that we would need the answer to. I, it sounds like she did a quarantine, but maybe didn't get sick. And so one of the things about getting the vaccine that is really important to know is that if you have the vaccine, you are generally protected as our belief, but you can still carry COVID in your nares. So you can still transmit COVID according to every single doctor I've read or listened about. We believe you can still have COVID in your nose, but that you won't get infected from it. You won't get symptoms from it. You won't develop a sickness from it. So it's really important to understand infection versus positive test. If she wasn't infected with symptoms, then she should get a second vaccine. But that's not my, I mean, that's not really for us to answer. I think she would need to speak with the people who gave her the vaccine and she'd need a full this is the kind of thing where we need to be documenting all of these effects after getting a vaccine on the VAERS website. And we need to understand what's happening when people get a vaccine, which isn't happening very often, but should happen. Yeah, so I, I would invite you all to a public access website to look at vaccine side effects, but it's really not user-friendly. I was just sharing with Dr. Kathleen, I, I spent 20 minutes trying to access the, what I heard was about 4,800 adverse events from these vaccines that have been reported by a doctor on our, a PhD doctor on our call. But I really had trouble navigating this uh, public access vaccine, but uh, some of you all might want to navigate it. Um, it's the VAERS, uh, it's a vaccine adverse events um, reporting website. It's V as in victory, A as in apple, E as in elephant, R as in rose, S as in Sam, vares.hhs.gov.gov. And um, yeah, Emily, if you could put it in the chat so they could, they could look at it, that would be great. But really it's public access. And then I wanna share that I did have a patient see me who's 32 year old healthcare worker who had a Pfizer vaccine about uh, 10 days ago, dose one, who has um, been suffering with painful lymph nodes of her lower neck so she had a, a lymphadenitis related to the vaccine. So I'm trying to navigate the website to report that adverse reaction myself. Um, Would you recommend Dr. Aki that she get the second vaccine in 21 days, 11 days from now? Okay, that's really tough because she's really in pain. So I basically told her, to, uh, she's otherwise healthy. So uh, I tell you, she's scared, she's scared to get the second vaccine. Um, that's a really good question. So at this point, she's 52% protected. She's got lymphadenitis that's active. I told her to um, let me know how she's doing before she gets a second vaccine. But I will tell you that if she's this tender and this reactive, I would tell her to wait. And then, and then we would reconsider. But what would you do? I would, I would tell her not to get it. Because she had a bad reaction. No, because I think she... Yeah, well, I think, again, we don't know what the second reaction would be, and, and we don't know what the long-term sequelae of that will be, because, again, if these things can be latent and if there can be other issues, and I don't want to get into this now, we can do it later if you want, but I believe that we have a good treatment for someone who's healthy, otherwise healthy, as you said, 32 years old, and I would want prefer to treat her if she got sick as opposed to give her a vaccine. Yeah, and the other thing is we, we could check antibody titers too to see if she got anything, but really she's one that she really wasn't even, she's healthcare, but she wasn't frontline healthcare. Mm -hmm. So that's that's another discussion. Like I, yeah, let, I don't wanna go to that discussion, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah, so she's gonna let me know if, I'm gonna see her and follow up in the next week or so and see how she's doing. Okay, so I hope we answered that question as best as we can without knowing the details on your sister. Uh, is there any harm in getting the vaccine while I, while I unknowingly had COVID, asymptomatic? 
See, I well, don't think that you are, if you are asymptomatic, you didn't really have COVID unless you can show me a lot of antibodies. So I hope that's clear. You didn't have the COVID disease or COVID illness. You were carrying COVID, but it never penetrated you and caused you to be sick. Yeah. So I think if you've had COVID and you have antibodies, you know, there's a lot of confusion um, with respect to, there's a lot of confusion with respect to whether or not you get the vaccine. I mean, at this point, I think the biggest challenge is gonna be, we may need it to go certain places to travel, whatever. So I think that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. But what about the science, doc, Dr. Kathleen, uh, in terms, I know you've been measuring quantitative antibodies. I've done several as well. I'm seeing a, de de uh, a degradation about 50% at about six months. I don't know what you're seeing. Uh, I did just get off the phone with someone who had an exposure who had bad COVID about five or six months ago. I'm waiting on her quantification. Um, 72 with a lot of medical, potential medical problems. Uh, I told her to go ahead and, and get waitlisted for the vaccine. Would you have recommended something different or? Well, for this patient, we can talk about that, but I, because I think it, again, when there's an individual decision and she's 72 and yada, 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 there's a lot of questions we have to ask. But I would say that if you've had COVID and you have antibodies that are documented, I do not expect the antibodies to be quantitatively, um, I've followed many people and their antibodies have come down appropriately, but I also measure natural killer cells. So I try to boost and keep the antibody system, the B cells system within the immune system healthy. And then I try to keep also the natural killer cells healthy. So I don't think it's one system that beats this disease. I think it, there are many systems. What we can measure specifically for COVID are antibodies. But just like IgE antibodies, you can't always measure that they're elevated unless you have an exposure. So I think it's a little tricky. I think we're looking for black and white and we're look and I think this is a gray area. So the conversation again has to be individualized, especially for a 72 year old woman. Yeah, and I think it's extremely tricky. I mean, I, on the other hand, there was a younger person who had COVID and some post COVID symptoms um, about three or four months ago who got uh, dose number one in Moderna this past week who had a rough reaction, a fever, fatigue. And then, and then I see in the chat that somebody's saying her dermatologist had her first vaccine after testing negative for COVID, but positive for antibodies, which means she had COVID. Uh, she had a pretty strong reaction to the first shot. She hasn't had the second shot yet. So, but that, that makes sense physiologically to me that if you overcome COVID, you have antibodies, we give you an immunization, you're going to have a brisk reaction, just like you would after you received the second vaccine. So if you've had a rough reaction with the first uh, in a series of two vaccines, it would make me a little nervous to give you the second vaccine. That, that's, that's a more kind of high level conversation, but it's just food for thought. I think the key thing that, you know, in this conversation is that everybody is still learning. And one of the things I'll say about our group, our small vaccine group, is that we're all very assertively learning, sharing with each other. And unfortunately, a lot of other people aren't doing that. So you're hearing very different things here than you might hear out there because everybody's just randomly thinking, get the vaccine, get the vaccine, it's the best thing to do. But we're being very thoughtful about this and we're still learning. That's a good point. Next question. Okay, so this one has to do with uh, long COVID or post-COVID sy symptoms or syndrome. Do you have any updates or new findings on people experiencing long-term or lingering symptoms after they've been infected? I know a few people who still haven't had smell since July. Hmm. Yeah, so the post-COVID syndrome or long, long COVID is actually the, def the, the NIH met in a group at the beginning of December, the definition is still being defined, but in our clinical practices, we are seeing people who have been injured from having experienced COVID. But the generally, the accepted idea with post COVID is eight to 12 weeks after COVID, you still have brain fog, fatigue, chest pain, inability to exercise, uh, sleep disturbance. So there's several criteria 
and it looks like chronic fatigue syndrome. And I have several patients in the practice. Uh, one who I have on Family Medical Leave Act, who I was never actually able to document. She had COVID, except she lost her taste and smell. She had negative COVID swabs, several of them. Her antibodies were negative. She had COVID. And she, you know, she's not a malingerer. I've had her for over a decade as a patient. She's a workaholic. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm filling out the forms. So, in terms of updates or new findings, um, Dr. Kathleen and I are working on designing a clinical trial to rescue uh, these patients. Uh, uh, using regenerative therapies. More later, because that's a good conversation to have. The second question about anosmia or inability to smell, we did a whole webinar on this, um, and it looks like three out of four people will get it back. Um, some of the therapies are, are include um, uh, high-dose omega-3 fatty acid. We're recommending phosphatidylcholine, uh, which is a healthy fat, and then also exercising the smell with aromatherapy. And there, if you go back and fireemupdoctors.com and look at our archived YouTubes, we did a whole web webinar on loss of, of smell. Uh, next question. In your last webinar, Dr. Kathleen mentioned patients who've experienced Bell's palsy and frozen shoulder after getting the vaccine. Is this due to the injection itself or what is in the vaccine? Well, I would say for, we don't know the direct answer to that, but the reality is, is that remember back a few questions ago when I mentioned that the immune system is at the root of a lot of things that are happening and the, um, the milieu, whether it's full of free radicals or oxidative stress um, that we're putting the vaccine into. So I don't think that it's the same thing in every patient. Um, and I think, you know, as Dr. Aki mentioned earlier, Bell's palsy may be reactivation of another virus. It's helpful to know what your body is trying to defend against, what, what microbes your body is, has antibodies to and what it's trying to defend against. And I don't think that there's any real way to know if the Bell's palsy is from uh, one of the herpes viruses that you've previously been infected with that had been latent um, or whether it's due to a combination of of that new vaccine with that, or whether it's just the new vaccine. But I think our goal is to optimize immunity, optimize redox and oxidative stress, and to really preventatively avoid these type of reactions when possible. Yeah, and then my only other comment is, uh, Dr. Kathleen and I wrote a chapter in uh, the book I co-edited called Fascia Function and Medical Applications. Uh, in regards to the frozen shoulder, that is a fascial problem. If the, if the frozen shoulder occurred on the side of the injection, medically it's called the ipsilateral side or the side of the injection, uh, one would worry that there might be an injection technique problem where they might have injected too high close to the tendon, um, which can happen actually as an adverse reaction to any vaccine. Uh, tetanus shot, et cetera. So um, if it occurred on the other side, it would be more of a systemic inflammation. So I'd want to know more about that if that really occurred. Absolutely. Great point. Next slide. Is it okay to get the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine a week apart? Well, I'm just, I'll jump in here and say that's a little bit close. Remember that to generate antibodies uh, or, or it's as early starts at about day seven. Usually we say it takes at least 14 days and persist up to 21 days. So that's a lot to ask of your body to, to layer vaccines that close in two different types of vaccines. Remember, there's only so much immune system army to go around. So let's say you get these vaccines back to back and your body was busy suppressing um, herpes of the lip or, or something, you could easily have overwhelmed your immune system. I think it's too close to, I, in, in the practice when we uh, recommend vaccines are usually a month apart, especially two different types of vaccines. Do you, have, do you have any other comments on that, Dr. Kathleen? No, I completely agree with you. I think it's okay, wise next to, to not overwhelm your immune system. Okay, I know several people who've had no problem with the first round, but experienced severe symptoms after the second COVID-19 vaccination. Since they are learning as they go, it occurs to me that there should perhaps be a longer period, uh, let's see, longer period in between to decrease the viral load? Viral load, oh, you mean the antigen load or the spike mm -hmm. protein load? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What do you think, Dr. Kevin? Well, I, I, think that, I think that this is a really smart group. I think these are great 
amazing, amazing questions. And I, and I really think that, you know, the pause factor has to be, this is, you're asking about a pause factor in learning. And I think learning as you go is why they chose three weeks. I mean, it's kind of like the hepatitis vaccine, right? Um, but I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I, I, I don't like to learn as I go. I don't yeah. like to learn on patients. I don't like to just, you know, take my chances and induce things, especially when I'm putting, you know, a vaccine with, with shifts in, in the bug a little bit into an mRNA into a human body. I don't know. I, I don't have an answer. I think it's distressing that we're learning as we're going. This is distressing me. Yeah, and and we you know we've never done this before. So normally there's four phases to approve drug approval, and we usually do for all four phases. I was just teaching the new interns this. So phase one is a small small group of human trial for safety. It's not going to first do no harm. The second is a small group human trial for safety and efficacy. Does it actually do anything? And the third is a wider spread like we did with both vaccines. Again, Pfizer was 40,000 people, Moderna was 30,000 people, but then they got emergency use authorization, skipping phase uh, four, uh, which we're now as a country in phase four. It's, it's widespread and we're learning as we're going, but basically that's it's replaced what's normally phase four before a drug gets approved. And the Pfizer study was actually approved for 25 months. So we're only like into month four or five of the 25 month study with a Pfizer vaccine? That's a great answer. Next slide. Do you have an opinion about the pros and cons of Moderna vaccine, Pfizer vaccine? I was asked this every single patient today, so I'll just give you my thumbnail on this one. Um, the answer is no. My 81-year-old mother has not received a vaccine yet, either one, uh, because I really don't have a preference, but I will tell you what I'm thinking, what our study group is thinking between the two. Um, Pfizer's new to the game of mRNA vaccines. Theirs is their their liposomal delivery is a little bit more unstable, which is why they have to be sub zero. Moderna has been in the business longer of mRNA vaccines, but they're new to widespread use of a drug. Um, that's number one. Number two is we find it perplexing as to why Moderna is a vaccine dose is three times higher than Pfizer's. It's 100 micrograms, and their protocol is separated by 28 days, as opposed to Pfizer, which is 30 micrograms, their protocol is separated uh, by 21 days. And so in the end, uh, whichever one you get, you want, want to make sure you follow the protocol. And that's what I've told our patients who in general are over 65 or definitely, I think over if you're over 75, no brainer. My 81 year old mother with diabetes, she's retired uh, University of Florida doctor for 30 years. I can't seem to get her a vaccine in Gainesville. So, uh, but anyway, the higher risk people should be getting uh, the vaccines, but the, it should be followed, following the protocol. Um, any other thoughts, Dr. Kathleen? No, I think that's extremely well said. Next slide. I have had reactions to vaccines in the past. What is the best vaccine available now or in the future? Are there any one-shot vaccines on the horizon? Okay, so as far as we know, there's not any typical adjuvants to these mRNA vaccines, but we're only rolling out a two-part mRNA vaccine, Pfizer and Moderna. On the horizon are the DNA vaccines. Uh, they are one shot, and but that's a whole other subject. Our study group will be digging deeply into the DNA the what, <laughs> delivered by a um, weakened virus, but it's a DNA-based vaccine, which is brand new. Um, on the horizon, but because they haven't been approved yet, we haven't spent the hours digging into that one at this point. But those are that protocol is a one shot. The AstraZeneca, for example, is a one shot protocol. Uh, individual discussion with with if if we're your doctors or your primary care doctor as to whether or not you should get the vaccine. Uh, next next question. Since the COVID-19 virus has an RNA base for reproduction, how are the recent vaccines that have been approved for urgent use that are mRNA based considered safe and effective? Is either of the vaccines available, Pfizer versus Moderna, safer and or more effective? I think I answered the last paragraph. Do you wanna comment on the first one, Dr. Kathleen? I'm not really sure what the question is. 
I'm not sure what the question is. So based on phase three clinical trials, our government has decided that these mRNA vaccines uh, are safe and effective. I, th I would refer you to those papers. They're, they're on open access for you to look at them yourself. Um, I will tell you that it's a brand new technology. The long-term effects of mRNA vaccine we're actually studying right now because we're in the middle of figuring out because we haven't been long-term yet. It's short, what, all our experience is very, very new, very uh, recent. Next slide. Oh, okay. We'll briefly do this because our time is short. Um, yeah, everyone knows the numbers. I mean, right now in Gainesville, we're having a second wave. I'm actively managing seven COVID patients and I'm very pleasantly surprised that uh, the ones over 60 have done and are continuing to do extremely well despite multiple medical problems. Um, I, I, we've managed over 80. I mean, the numbers keep growing at this point um, here in Gainesville, but only one death. Uh, I told you about her before she died pretty quickly. She had interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, got admitted to the hospital and died within a couple of days, but she was baseline lung disease person. The rest have done extremely well. I have probably five to eight who have pretty, pretty severe post-COVID syndrome, still trying to get better, in which case I'm actually trying some uh, uh, progressive intravenous nutritional therapy protocols to, and I have had very, very good success uh, with them. Dr. Kathleen, Massachusetts. Yeah, in Massachusetts, we're, we're also pretty much in lockdown here. Uh -huh. Um, with reactivation and very, very busy hospital bases. Um, I have quite a few active cases in my practice as well. Everybody's doing well. I don't have anyone who's been to a hospital, um, you know, as a, res as a result of COVID, fortunately. I've had COVID. I stayed home. I did well, um, took, took my treatment and, and recovered, I think, pretty well. So no concerns. Um, we're still, it, it's just amazing. I mean, I think at some point we're all, we're going to know so, most of the people in the practice will have had it or will have had the vaccine. So pretty, pretty soon it's going to be bigger and bigger, these statistics, but, you know, up at 400,000, okay. almost in the country dying, that's quite a bit, quite a few people. Um, it's just crazy. I do think we should be doing and having our patients be prepared to be in touch with us. The, with exposure, with a positive test and infection, and then we should be prepared to treat them within 24 hours. And I know that both Dr. Aiki and I do that. So I think we're fortunate to be in, in this group. Oh, next slide. Okay, I guess that'll wrap it up for now. Thank you for coming from Boston. The, the questions in the question box really should have individual uh, appointments to um, that we haven't an answered uh, to discuss and feel free to message uh, at the farm up doctors to get your individual appointments for now everybody be safe be well and god bless you all thank you all for coming thanks dr kathleen thank and you thank all. you so much emily I'm emily's impressed. last day emily's last day today so thank you so much for 10 months of great effort emily and best emily, of luck you're the you. best best of luck thank you guys both so much thank you we'll see the rest of you next week bye-bye new year Alrighty, so I will go through our few books that we have and our supplement deals. First, we have our Kick COVID-19 to the Curb. We still have a few paperback guidebooks at our office, and then we have the ebook available on Amazon Kindle, Google Play, and Barnes and Noble. Again, the paperback is $29.99 and the ebook is $9.99. And if you purchase either versions of our book, you can get 20% off of the ultra potent vitamin C and zinc AG. Just send us proof of your receipt, whether that's a email, a screenshot, an actual receipt. Um, as long as you can provide that you purchase the book, we will go ahead and honor that 20% discount code. Next, we have your triad, which is going to be the curcumin, vitamin C, and glutathione. These three work great together, and they can be all these supplements can be found on our Get Healthy store, which is on our farmupdoctors.com website. All these codes are valid until the last day of January, so the 31st. And the code for these three is going to be Fire em Up Ageless, A G E L E S S. Again, I would recommend either screenshotting um, each of these slides if you're trying to remember the code. And if you go ahead and log off, you can always go back onto our Facebook or YouTube page and find each of these videos saved there for after. 
Next, we have your vitamin D pack. We're gonna have the mycelized D3 and K2, as well as the pill form, which comes in 2000 IU and 5000 IU. Um, all three of these, again, can be found on our Fire em Up Doctors website. And each of these will use the code FIREMUPBITED, B-I-T-D. Again, good until the 31st. Next, we have your PRP spray, your zinc, and your quercetin. All great for your immune system and great to take as COVID protocol. The PRP spray is going to use the code FIREMUPPRP. The zinc is going to use the code FIREMUPZINC. And then the quercetin is going to use the code FIREMUPQ. And again, on our website, FIREMUPDOCTORS.GETHEALTHY. And then all good until the 31st. Next, we have your omegas. We have both the vegan and non-vegan version. So if you're not a vegan, you can go ahead and do the pro omega and you can take 10% off using the code fire up omega. And then if you are a vegan, we have the algae omega and that 10% off code will be fire up algae. Again, good until the 31st on our fire up store. Next, we have your NO pack. Um, this is what Dr. Nathan Bryan came and talked about when he was on. Dr. Aki recommends this 100%. So the NO indicator strips are gonna be here. And then we have the NO um, in tablet form as well as dissolvable lozenges. So whatever your preference is, all three can be found on our website. And these will use the code FIREMUPHUMAN, H-U-M-A-N. And again, that is for 10% off. And then we have your melatonin, which is great for sleep as well as other benefits. So we have a liquid version and a lozenge version. Um, both are, again are going to be found on our website and both are going to use the code fire em up sleep F S L E E P. Oops. Then we have Dr. Aki's fine tune your hormone symphony, which again is a great guide to understanding your hormones. And this can be found on our fire em up doctors.com website. And lastly, we have the fascia function and medical applications textbook, which Dr. Aki did reference today. Again, we have a few paperback copies in our office. If you send us an email at nfimgmv, as in gators make victory at gmail.com, we will offer curbside, curbside pickup for $55. And then if you would like to order online, you can find it on our website, fireemupdoctors.com or amazon.com. And that is all I have for you today. And unfortunately, today is my very last day with you guys. It has been such a pleasure being able to come on here every week and be the co-host to Dr. Aki and Dr. Kathleen and sort of just help them through the whole process. Um, I will definitely miss everyone. I will still be checking in regularly and popping in to watch these webinars. And um, I just hope everyone has a wonderful year. I hope everyone stays safe with COVID and everything else. And I will see you all maybe sometime in the future. Have a great weekend. We're so glad you joined us today. We hope we've given you the tools to take control of your health. For more good medicine and information about any treatments, supplements, and resources discussed today, please visit us at www.fireemupdoctors.com. That's F-I-R-R-I-M-Updoctors.com. And wherever you're listening from, remember to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels so you don't miss out. The information provided is not a substitute for professional medical advice. This should not be used to diagnose, treat, or manage health problems without consultation. If you do experience any of the symptoms discussed today, please contact your nearest healthcare professional.